So I don't know, some of you may have been here back in November last year. I did a brief presentation where we designed this system that I'm going to demonstrate a portion of. And we were talking about what you do with the data and things like that. And so now I'm going to demonstrate that whole sequence. We're going to do a collection while we're here. And we're going to process the data. You'll be able to see it on the screen. And I'll run it through our report generator, generate some statistics, and we'll show it to you real time. So the first thing is, how many here have an AT&T phone with you? If you have it on, I want you to turn it on. I want you to put it in, in non-airplane mode, and so in some application there will turn on, and it'll request a bear from the LTE network, and we'll be getting your phones on this thing during the collection, okay? So I want you to do that. If you have them on airplane mode, turn them on, okay? All right, so... I'm going to go very briefly now. This presentation has some introduction slides, and I'm not even going to go through them because we're very pressed for time. I want to make sure the demonstration is the thing that I know you guys really want to see, and it's, it's pretty interesting. So there's some, if this presentation is available to you guys, there's a bunch of information in the front that describes the program and what we're doing and why we're doing it and stuff like that. I'm going to skip through that, but I included it in the presentation for context so that you could have it if you needed it, okay? So just bear with me as I just kind of step through that stuff right now. Okay, so there's this right here is our, our test process from actually planning the test to actually executing and running the and generating the artifacts. We're going to do a portion of that today. Um, this the system that you see is in. Okay, so we got a portion of it up here and a portion of it back there, and this is the system that you see right there. Um, we've got antenna mass. We've got two omni antennas that we're using today. Typically, when we run these collections, and I'll show you some pictures of, a demo, of some testing we did um, during, over the Clemson game weekend with the help of some of the students that are, that are your colleagues, and they were a real big help, and it worked out really well, and I'll show you some data from that as well. But we usually use the directional antenna, and I included one of the directional antennas on the mass so you could see it. It covers all the LTE bands across the nation, and it's, 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 uh, it's designed for small cell as a downlink antenna, so it's got MIMO in it, two by two. And uh, two by just it's, it's not two by two because you need two of them to do two by two, but anyway. And so there's two cables that come off it. The phases are random. We don't even know what they are. And they, you call the company and say, "Well, I can't tell you that. It's random." I was like, "Okay, well that makes sense for MIMO, right? I mean that does make sense." But anyway, so that thing we got it run into the San Jose Wave Judge 5000. San Jose is a company in Honolulu, Hawaii. Great place to get a job. And uh, that box costs a quarter of a million dollars. Electronics is on, in it are, are not that expensive, but the amount of DSP that goes into this thing to do what it can do is where the company spent their money. They're the only company that we've ever that we've been able to find that can do what you're about to see, which captures simultaneously all the downlink control information and then all the uplink control information from every UE that you can detect depending on your antenna system, okay? Depending on the range of the antennas that you have, okay? So what we're going to do is just demonstrate that that in a second here, okay? But the first thing is, how do you know what you're testing? You know, because it can do, the configuration we have can do a single sector, and we've been able to demonstrate it up to 20 megahertz, but it's designed to work up to 10 megahertz bandwidth sectors, okay? So I'll just, so on Tuesday, uh, Priya Brada and myself, we used these cell phones. I mean, those are normal cell phones, but they're main, but they have a special flash loaded onto them by a company called InfoVista. These are called TEMS phones, T-E-M-S. And so it's a diagnostic test phone, and it's got a whole slew of screens, and it's running like 128 different parameters simultaneously. So in fact, I'm going to turn this phone on and run a script on it so that it's also being captured by the system at the same time, okay? And I've done a rat, a rat lock to LTE and a band lock to band 17 because that's the band that we're going to collect in here. So let me start that real quick. Let me just turn, let me go ahead and start the script. And boom, there it goes. And it is, yeah, it has no GPS, but it's still running. So I'll just set that up so it actually gets collected. Okay, so on Tuesday, Priya Brada and myself were here, and I ran these two, pho we, two phones. He used one, one of them's a Verizon phone, We've got a Verizon um, SIM in it, the other one's got AT&T, and we just walked along the back window. Now, if you notice, the, so the first thing is, what is the tar what what band can I actually get in this environment in here? You know, we've got Hokie Stone, which from talking with Tad, there's like 20 dB of loss. To, you know, it varies in frequency, I'm sure, but it's very lossy. So it's like, which bands do you get? And lo and behold, so I did a I did a rat lock, but I did not do a band lock. And if you can see from right here, see that little dot right there, and you can see we were actually here. This is Lavery Hall, but 
you can see that the dilution of precision on the GPS signal was so bad, it put us 150 meters over that way. But it tells us that we're in band 17 here. But it's interesting, I drove around this whole area, and that's why you see this right here, to determine what are, what is around here for the AT&T. And as soon as I go outside, it went to band 2 and stayed on band 2 all the time. But as soon as you come inside, it switches to band 17. That kind of makes sense. Band 17 is 700 megahertz. The attenuation is less. So the RSRQ and the RSRP are higher. So the phone is going to prioritize onto band 17 until that band is saturated. And then it will provide band 2 for other users. That's what's going to happen. And that's pretty much what we saw. So interesting enough, so the first thing is, what's the band? So I figured out we're going to do band, band 17 seems to be the one that works in here. So we could do the demonstration for you guys. And the next thing is, okay, now, where the heck is the antenna and what is the sector number and stuff? And so we found out it's sector number 349. And so once I had that, we go and we figure out what's the center frequency. The, these, these phones will collect all the center frequency information from the EARFCNs for the uplink and the downlink and a whole bunch of other information. And so again, I figured out that, okay, so here, and this is the RSRQ for this along this wall, and it's around minus 10, which is actually, it's not great, but it's not poor. RSRQ is down around minus 19 is where typical handover occurs, unless you've got a lot of small cells with a lot of really strong signals, okay? And uh, then take a look at, as I drove around for this same, for, this is for sector 352, which is the, actually the band 2 sector around here. You can see how large it is. The antennas for this sector here are located on the brick building on the far side of the circle at the intersection of North Main and Price's Fork. If you guys have gone by there, you can see the antennas uh, that are on top of that. Okay, so did all that survey work, figure out we're going to do the demo with sector 349 on band 17. So now we'll go into the, into the demo. Okay, so I'm going to switch over to the WaveJudge software. Okay. So we've already configured this, but I'm going to just step through it real quick. Um, there's the, we're going to run in what's called an IntelliJudge capture on this. So first off, we've got to configure it and define the test. So it's a five megahertz sector, and there's all there's a handful. You know, I don't. There's a whole bunch of different test modes you can operate this thing in ter terms of just doing a collection of all the data. There's not a lot of things. There's a couple of things you need to set. We've already set them already, so I'm not going to mess with that. The next thing is you got to set your frequency for their center frequency for your for your downlink. We've got the downlink on receiver one. You can see the signal power varying uh, through the 80 the, from through the A to D's. So we've got it all set up, and I've, I'm going to minimize the gain. I'm going to maximize the gain by minimizing the attenuations because we're not in a great spot for doing this. If I was doing a real measurement for my program, I probably wouldn't do it from here, but it's okay for the purpose of demonstration. It works just great. We're Okay, and then the uplink, you set that, it's a 712.5. Now for this one, you can see, does everybody got their phones? This phone is running, and I use an Omni antenna, which has got a donut pattern, it's vertically polarized. So there's, you can see it's pretty low, which is what I would expect. There's not a lot of phones available, the range is not very great, but that's okay. So the next thing we do is we'll do a okay, we'll uh, run a, I'm gonna run a test I'm just going to run a quick IntelliJudge capture with just, you can see we've got this screen over here, it's got chart properties. There's a whole bunch of different, all the, all the different message types are kind of organized into these categories. I'm just going to pick TV so I can see the PC fishes. Because what, and what I'm going to do is just going to start it just for a second, and you can see it's running. Now, I'm going to stop it. The white lines are the downlink control information, the ones that are purple tinted are the uplink information. And you can see the different C renties in the rentie column right here. So you're seeing there's, there's, there's 4871. I will bet you that's this guy. Look how many of those are. I'm actually sending a one megabit file over and over and over again, and it's not stopping. So I would bet you that 4871 is probably me. But there's a few other renties in there as well. So what I want to do right now is I look at the PC fish and I look at the sign R, and it's 7.72. As long as the sign R for the PC fish is greater than negative 10, then the San Jose will synchronize it just like your cell phone does to that sector so that it can establish synchronization and then start doing the capture that you just saw running a second ago. So the next thing we're going to do, I'm going to run this for three minutes and let it run and then I'm going to save the file and then we're going to um, 
run it through the report generator and generate some statistics and show you guys statistics on this cell. Now, so you think about it, I'm getting all the downlink information. The downlink controls all the UEs that are requesting bears within this sector. Since I'm getting all the downlink information, all the control information for all the UEs, no matter where they are in this sector, it could be downstairs, it could be in the building over there, I'm getting all the information. I may not be getting all the uplink information because of the range of the antennas and the noise floor of the system, but you know, that's, that's superfluous, that's additional info. There are certain things we could possibly do with that, but we, what we care about for this program is understanding the uplink assignments and how often those things are being used on a, for a, a subframe for subframe basis, okay? So let me go ahead and I'm gonna use my phone and do a timer real quick. This is what we did, and, and while that's running for three minutes, it's probably a good time for me to show a little bit of what we did over this last weekend, just use the time efficiently while it's running. Okay, so let me set this up real quick. Hold on, bear with me. Okay, start and stop and start and go. Okay, so that's running. So we'll let that run for three to four minutes. Now, while that's running, go back to my presentation. Okay, so last weekend, we actually did some measurements where we set up on top of McComas Hall, facing Lane Stadium, and Tad Kartik and Ahmad helped me a lot. They were really great. And we set up on the roof there, and you can see the antenna system there. So what we're doing is we want to measure four LTE sectors over three days. So we did data collections on Friday, as many as we could in a three-hour period, and then on Saturday from 1 to 4 p.m. We didn't do it during the game, but as well, people were tailgating, there was a lot of people around. And then I did it again on Monday morning, which is like, a more typical day around that area, okay? So, you know, we use that break, you can just kind of see where we were and a picture of the guys with the test system. Whoops, don't do that. <coughs> what did I do? Come on. What's it doing? I don't know what happened, but I got this thing in a funky mode. Okay, so the first thing is, what are we doing? What are we testing? Okay, so we've, what we found out is there's a small cell DAS system that Verizon has set up around the Lane Stadium area. If you go look on the top of Ambler Johnson on the west bank, there's two DAS antennas up there. Maybe some of you have seen them. They, one of them faces Cassell Coliseum and the other faces over the parking lot and over Thompson Field. Sector 10 is in that one that faces over. Sector 11 faces the other direction. They're adjacent. But this information here, this is the RSRQ from a, a drive test and walk test that I did with those same phones um, in that area to determine where is the coverage so I could figure out where to point those directional antennas because we use the directional antennas with the at, with 8 dB a gain they have so that we can get as much range on the uplink signals as possible. I know I'm going to be able to synchronize the downlink. It was right there. I could see it. It was really close. But as much uplink information as I could get. So I want to make sure that I'm facing my antenna at an angle, and so I figured out that pretty much going to the center is that, that, that bore side of my antenna, I want to port it in the direction of that red arrow that I had there, okay? I don't know why what happened here. So anyway, we did that, and so what I did was I used our report generator, which you're going to see in a minute, and I actually ran, what we've done is we've added a capability to be able to create data sets. There were seven files from that sector taken over those three days. Two on Friday, three on Saturday, and two more on Monday. So I created individual data sets for each of those three days, and then I'm doing a comparison. And that's what's here. So the first thing is, there's a bunch of cell parameters that are static information about the cells that we capture. So there's the first data set. And it's all the same sector, so you're going to see the same information every time. So we don't really need to spend a lot of time on that. But because the, the interesting stuff is what's coming up here. Now, I'm going to have to rotate this, so bear with me. And they only allow you to rotate it right, so you have to do it three times. It's really chintzy. But anyway, so, okay, so the first thing is PRB size probability. So you can see, so what we got is blue is on Friday, red is on Saturday, and green is on Monday. How are we doing on time? Okay, I'm gonna, I may have to stop this in the middle. We can come back to it just so we can continue with the demo, okay? So you can kind of see, you know, this is like how, for each grant, how many uplink PRBs were assigned to a CRENTI for that specific subframe transmission or TTI, okay? And that's what, you're, that's what this statistic is looking at. 
And you can see that it makes sense when there's a million people around that it's going to really peak on what's, what the, the, what the, uh, the uh, doggone it, um, scheduler is really prioritizing four PRBs typically, okay? Now you can see there's some that are larger, but so that's that statistic. The next one is where are they starting across? And then the, what's interesting about this is you can see that there's three control channels on each side, right? Because this is all shared channel data. All right. As you can see, the kind of increments of four make sense because of this, the previous statistic you saw where four was dominant. So now you can see where do they start across the channel. And this is a this is a 10 megahertz channel, so you got 50 PRBs total, zero to 49. The next statistic is the occupancy probability. This is the op the chance over the total number of of TTIs across the measurement time frame, which was five minutes, that um, that PRB was used. And now you can see the percentages, and these are percentage of occupancy including nulls. If it was not used, so those are counted also, so you can kind of see how often it was used. And it kind of makes sense, right? Green was Monday, it's fairly low. Blue was Friday afternoon, okay, there's more people. Kids are having to move their cars out of that parking lot. People are arriving for the weekend game. Kids are getting out of class. It's time to go party in downtown Blacksburg. So you see people, and then on Saturday is when Hokie Village is set up, people are there, the parking lot is full of people tailgating, this is what you see. So I'm going to stop, i got to go back to our wave judge here, and I'm going to stop the collection, and we're going to process this. Okay, so the first thing is, I've got to apply a filter, IntelliJudge filter, because I don't want all this data, it's a ton. i got to export this as an XML so that I can go run it through our report generator. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to open the IntelliJudge filter, and I've got a, I'm going to import a filter that I've got on the hard drive, which gives the things that I want. I just got to go find it. I think it's right here. Yep, there it is, right there. It's that one. Boom, open it. So it, you can tell the things that are highlighted, there's certain messages within there. And so now I want to go, I'm going to click f close, update filters, OK. Now it's going to rerun that data with the filters provided. I can turn that off and notice that they're all bold. All the messages are bold because there's information that I filtered, that I collected, that I wanted. That's what that's telling me. So this is just the filtered data from that large data. It collects everything. And now I can export just what I want. Okay, this XML file is going to get pretty large. So let it run. It has to run through the whole thing. It does it a lot faster than the normal. It'll only take a couple of minutes. How are we doing on time? Are we okay? Uh, about, are we okay? Power and, uh, uh, and one of the columns, the power. Which one? Sign R or what? Which uh, one? Oh. Uh, That's the receive power at this interface right here. Okay, okay so the, the, the gain of the antenna, the losses of the cables to, to, the, to the port to the input of the device. So you got to realize that's, and that's, for, from the downlink, that can tell you something about propagation loss, but you have to know your losses and your gains pretty well to get it accurate. But from the uplink, you don't know where those handsets are. You have no idea. They didn't tell you nothing, right? So, okay, that's done. Now I'm going to export this file. I'm going to click in here. I'm going to export as XML. And I created a folder for today. Where is it? Seminar demo. I'll just call it test, just so we can move on quickly and save. And there's 308. 0.9k lines, so it's it's creating the file. It'll take it a minute. It's actually quite a bit more data than I would expect to get, but it's that's good. It makes it more interesting. This shouldn't take much longer, Priyabada. We're doing fine on time. I'm just gonna I'm gonna there's the whole test event data entry cycle in the report generator. I'm just gonna skip all that so we can just get to the real good stuff, okay? Because it's not that, I mean, I'm not, this is just a demo. It's not like something, it's not part of our test campaign for the DSO, so. Come on. Hurry up. Okay, good, we're done. All right, so now I've already opened and turned on the report generator. I already got it started. So now I'll create data set, add data set, upload the data file, go to here. Go to the folder we just were in. Where is it? There it is. There it is. Open. Take it a little bit to run. 
Okay, so now typically, now I said okay. Now I'm gonna generate report. Now typically there's a whole bunch of stuff that we have set up so we can, you know, you know, select the date, the test type, all that kind of stuff. I'm just gonna skip all that stuff. There's things like, there are some cases where we will run data files where we will be running with DOD networks that exist and we will actually know what eNodeB equipment is, what the hardware versions and software versions are. We can select the scheduler type and things like that. But in this case, we don't know any of that stuff. You know, there's no way to know. So unless you work for the company the carriers and you know what they set up for that specific cell tower over there. So I'm just gonna run through this and I can upload pictures if I want. And then I'm gonna select everything and please work like you're supposed to. It generally does. And boom, and let it run. So it'll now generate statistics. We were looking at a similar one. It's gonna be a report in the PDF just like what you saw that I was starting to show. Anyway, well, hopefully this, is, this shouldn't take it shouldn't take very long. I mean, while we're waiting, any questions? I know I'm talking very quickly because we're limited on time. You guys have other seminars to go to. Any questions while we're this is running? Okay. So can can we get an idea of like what is the uplink transmission power of this device? Okay, well you're gonna see some information. One of, the, one of the parameters that's on that list that you see is the UE transmit power distribution. There's a uplink report that's called the power headroom report. Now there's a certain criteria that has to be met and that's, that configuration is set up inside. In fact, I can click on that. In fact, I should have done that previously real quickly. But it's only a certain criteria has to be met before the UE actually has to provide it. And so we can, and the, the power headroom report it tells the enode B, my last transmission was this far below your Pmax, which Pmax is a fixed parameter that comes, that's in the cell parameter list. So we can determine, you know, every time, every time a UE sends a power headroom report, what its transmit power was at that time. But the thing is that we're finding out after running, we've been running this over several sectors now, what we're finding out is that there's, statistically, there's not enough power headroom report given to provide a statistical basis for all the UEs that you're getting, seeing in the sector. So it may not be representative of reality, which matters. So it's like, for what we were hoping to get out of it, it's not quite as good. You do get some information out of it, which is interesting, but it's not statistically viable for what we're trying to do. Because we're trying to take this data and inform our models, right? That's the whole point of this, of what reality is. Okay, so it says it's done. So let's go ahead and um, download it open and open the file and these are the statistics from that collection please work okay there's the cell parameters that we extracted from the um, stat from the MIBs and the SIBs on that cell you can see like there's uh, like the cell ID 349 MNC MNC the EARFCN the the RSTX power in the download is 20 dBm the power headroom configuration of the loss change is 3 dB. So that's kind of interesting. That means there are probably less power headroom reports in this sector than in some that have 1 dB because it takes a change of 3 dB before the UE is required to make a report, right? So it's less often. Uh, the P0 is, the alpha is 0.8. P0 for PUSCH is minus 80. That's the target power per PRB that the E node B wants to receive your, your uplink signal for the shared channel. And there's also a target P0 for the PUCCH. That's minus 116. It's very interesting. You notice the difference between those two is like 26 dB or 36. That's, we see that a lot. It's amazing how different that is. The control channels don't need to be nearly as strong as a shared channel. I think it may have to do with the modulation and things like that. But anyway, that's, and you see the Pmax for this sector is 23 dBm, that's pretty typical. We have seen some that are 20. And here's the statistics. Again, I'll have to rotate three times. Sorry about that. Okay, so size probability, typically two for this, kit, for this channel. This is a five megahertz channel, so it's only 25 PRBs wide. Can't have anything more than that. You see some at 16. In fact, I should shut this off. Stop, come on, froze on me, sucker. Come on. It froze. That's all right. Let's let it go. All right. Uh, location probability. Wow, it likes to start at the very first um, shared channel PRB. There's three control channels. 
Use a little bit on the side, so it leaves a lot on the sides and not very much in the middle. Here's the occupancy probability. You know, you see as little as 10% in the middle, to up to 27% on, on near the edges. Uh, and that's, I, this is how many, and up to 90,000 in five, we did a little over five minutes. We did five minutes and, um, and like 15 seconds. So over that time frame, there was, for this specific PRB was used over 90,000 times. And that's, you can see the trend. This shape and this shape are going to be the same. One's a, one's a PDF and the other is the actual count. That kind of, we, Why is it you? I, you know, we see all kinds of shapes, Jeff. We, it's not always like that. We see some. In fact, I'll go back to the, the ones that I was showing from this weekend. I mean, we see we see all we see humps in the middle. We see ones that are flat with spikes on the outside, and then the very last ones on the outside are really low. I don't I don't know why. I mean, we don't. If we had information about the scheduler, we could figure all that out, but we don't have it. So. Or maybe it's just the discretion of the, the technician. Yeah, I would imagine the CQI information provided by the UEs probably has some input on that. Or is it, is that, did I could say that right, or is it QCI? Maybe it's QCI. You know what I'm talking about. It It tells it about the quality, and you can, it, it can, it, depending on the configuration of the E-Node B, it's one value for the whole channel, or it partitions it into chunks and gives it a different value so it can see if there's a fade across the channel from the perspective of that UE's propagation path, right? Depending on the differences in clutter and fades and stuff like that. I know. I mean, it's constantly doing that, so it could use that. We were talking about this in our discussion earlier about whether or not, you know, we don't know what the schedule is doing, but is it employing some water flowing method and that happened to be for those channels that happened? Yeah, to be I don't know. I mean, that's, that's a good question. I don't have any information about what scheduler has been prioritized for that thing. I have no idea if it's round robin or a proportional fare. I have no idea. Uh, if I had the spectrum receiver operating, we might have been able to see something like that. But I don't have that today because of the lack of GPS. So, anyway, and there's there's some there's, there were power headroom reports, but you notice how there's a lot at 23. That might make sense. A lot of inside phones got a lot of loss through the walls and stuff, jacking it up to max. You know, so that there may be some truth to this. But like I said, we have no idea. I can go look at the file and see how many reports did I get from which. C rentees of the number of C rentees that are assigned over that time frame, and I will bet you the number of C rentees that actually did power, you know, power headroom reports is very small compared to the total list that's there. Because you got to, if you're not moving, unless there's a fade, you're probably not exceeding that 3 dB change requirement um, criteria. So you're not probably doing a lot of power headroom reports. It's not something that has to happen all the time. Uh, let's see, and the usage statistics. You know, how often is a, is a PRB used from 0 to 25? And you see 0, none happens a lot, right? So there's, of the total number of subframes, about 44% of them, there was no transmissions at all, right? And then it tells you how often, you know, how full. This is basically looking at how full was a specific TTI and it counted them all across of the total count across that 5 minutes and 15 seconds. And you, 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 know, you should see, you, you're going to see, you know, unless someone's really sending a lot of data, you're not going to see a whole lot out here because this is on the uplink channel, not on the downlink, okay? All right, that's what we care about. The number of simultaneous UE transmissions in any TTI. Now, you notice that you can't see any data down here. That's because zero is so big. And remember, that's the same, 44%. We just saw that, right? That should match. But if there's a number down here somewhere, there was at least one TTI, there were six UEs transmitting at one time in a subframe. That's as many as, that's the highest we saw in that five minutes while we were talking. Okay? Average UEs over time, this is 30 second chunks. This is how many UEs have active bears in that 30 second time frame, whether it's a, a, a connection, a request, establishment, or reestablishment, a handover. We look at all those things that we count them. Okay? So there's but somewhere between. 60 and a little higher than 90 UEs, you know, in every 30 second chunks across that. You can see there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 9, 10. We dump the last 15 seconds. If it doesn't complete, it doesn't have 30 seconds, we drop it. And this is AT&T. This is the band 17, 5 megahertz channel right here. And then now we're looking at how many access requests. You know, there's multiple bearers can be per UE, right? You see as many as 35,000 access requests and as few as 17,000 during that time frame in 30 second chunks. 
and then the uplink throughput pretty small really between 0.2 and 0.35 megabits per second okay so the last thing I wanted to show you is that what we did was we were looking at this information like in fact let me open up if I open up one of these you can see the the uh, decoded information within that DCI format zero which the DCI format zero is where your uplink grants are provided by the downlink this resource allocation 228 that's called a RIV from that single number you can determine the start and the width of, of the PRB assignments for that C Renty for that specific transmission to be which the uplink is required to transmit four milliseconds after it receives this transmission and then there's the uh, there's the MCS and R this is all about the setting the uh, modulation and the coding uh, whether it's new data or it's a retransmission uh, closed TPC is one so there is some closed loop power control in this sector um, DMRS cyclic shift and I think you can see a hopping flag there's no hopping at this time and there you go so that's just one type of message you can see the SIBs and if I open the message you can just keep scrolling down through it there's a whole lot of information in here you can I can look at the uh, there's your P max which was 23 which you saw earlier um, some scheduling information and there's some non-critical extensions those are extra stuff depending on the carrier the one that's most interesting to me is if I go to RRC at NAS, I go to a connection setup, message, C1, connection setup, critical extension, come on, it's just a, these hierarchies are, anyway, they're a pain in the butt. Um, where is it? Oh, Mac main config, explicit value, PHR configuration, there. So these are the values you saw in the beginning. Then the, the prohibit, the periodic timer and the prohibit timer are set for 200 subframes and the path loss change of db3 and you saw that earlier so this is it is that's how you that's there's the configuration that's provided to that specific ue for its power headroom control reports is on the uh connection setup so anyway so when i did the xml all that all that embedded data within each message was actually copied which is the data i needed in order to generate the statistics that i just showed you okay all right i think we're wrapped up and you guys are out of time any other questions